Marlene Beckman, and I work at the Office of Justice Programs. And we're here to give you an introduction to the Attorney General's Reentry Council, which has been mentioned a few times already. Uh, we have quite a terrific array of uh, federal colleagues here, and I think we have some really valuable information to share with you. I want to start off uh, by introducing Tanya Robinson, who will speak to uh, the uh, audience first, and then I'll introduce the rest of the panel. Tanya Robinson is Special Assistant to the President for Justice and Regulatory Policy, the White House Domestic Policy Council. Before arriving at the White House just this year, Ms. Robinson worked in both the public and private sectors. On the public side, she worked as counsel to then Senator Joseph Biden on the Senate Judiciary Subcommittee on Crime and Drugs, where she focused on civil rights, counterterrorism and domestic security, reentry, and corporate governance issues. Ms. Robinson holds a JD from Harvard Law School, and she also obtained a postgraduate degree in African Studies from the University of Cape Town in South Africa. Ms. Robinson. Well, thank you, Marlene, for that. I appreciate it, uh, and good afternoon. Uh, I, I have to confess that I'm a bit of an interloper here. Uh, I just recently joined the White House only a few months ago uh, and, and attended my first reentry re council meeting uh, less than two weeks ago, um, but I've had the good fortune to engage with Amy and Marlene and others at the Justice Department around the reentry council effort. I know a good part of my uh, recent learning on this topic to them and the really extraordinary work that's come out of the reentry council. Uh, so I am uh, one, delighted to be here, but especially pleased to join uh, this plenary session in particular. Uh, it is important and a timely gathering, uh, since, as I've mentioned, it, it follows on the heels of the most recent Reentry Council meeting. But I think it also really signals the measure of leadership and commitment that the administration has brought to justice issues broadly, um, but to the reentry uh, set of reentry issues in particular. Uh, uh, I am here uh, representing the White House and the Domestic Policy Council uh, in particular. Uh, while I am still uh, uh, learning the rhythms of the White House, given that my tenure there is relatively new, uh, the issue is not a new one. It's not a new one for me, and it's not a new one for the Domestic Council uh, Policy Council either. Um, as Marlene mentioned, uh, I worked on the Senate Judiciary Committee some years ago, and much of what we did in that space on Capitol Hill, in partnership with many of you and with folks at this table, uh, led to the uh, eventual passage of the Second Chance Act. Uh, it was a priority then for uh, the Vice President, and it is a priority now uh, for the President and for this administration. Uh, again, one of the highlights of my job to date has been participation in the, the first Reentry Council meeting. Uh, and I, again, have had the good fortune to engage with what is a really committed team of professionals across the federal family who uh, are dedicated to reentry issues. Uh, the measure of work and accomplishment that the Reentry Council has produced to date is the result of, again, leadership exercised by many of the individuals who you'll hear from today on this panel. Uh, so I should express my uh, gratitude uh, to them for really the extraordinary work and effort today and offer up the White House's commitment to continue to match their enthusiasm uh, and support their work, uh, all with an eye toward uh, making real and sustainable progress in this area. Uh, from our perspective, and it's a conversation that we've had quite a bit uh, within the White House recently, uh, if reentry doesn't work, there are terrible consequences, not only for the offending individual, but also there is a profound impact, as I know you appreciate, on families, on children, uh, in our communities. Uh, if reentry fails, there is considerable family distress, 
uh, children, of inmates suffer, and, and lives and, and futures are lost. Uh, but at least from our perspective, and I know from yours as well, smart reentry strategies can mitigate the effects of what may seem otherwise uh, like intractable problems. Uh, smart reentry strategies can save us money, uh, and smart reentry strategies can save lives. And it is that philosophy that has driven uh, at least the White House perspective uh, and has driven the agenda on this front uh, more broadly as well. My colleagues here will highlight the record of accomplishment for you, but I did want to uh, at least mention a couple of places where the Domestic Policy Council, which is a relatively small staff of folks who are uh, targeting a broad range of domestic issues, justice issues being one of them, give you two examples of how we've been engaged in recent months, and then preview for you the three broad areas where we're hoping to uh, uh, bring some lift or amplify some efforts in addition to the work that the Reentry Council already has underway. Uh, first, the Domestic Policy Council has led the Responsible Fatherhood Working Group, uh, which, as its name suggests, advances responsible fatherhood and stable families uh, through both enhanced coordination and collaboration across federal agencies. Uh, the overarching goal of the group's work is to encourage fathers to take responsibility for the well-being of their children, including helping disconnected fathers reconnect with their families. Uh, the working group has identified as one of its uh, focus areas, the need to support fathers who are incarcerated or reentering society after incarceration, including increasing access to job opportunities and supporting the, the reconnection process. Uh, that, before my tenure at DPC, has been a huge priority of both the justice and regular, regulatory team, but also the mobility and opportunity team within DPC. And our anticipation is that that will be a strong focus going forward as well. Uh, we also continue to engage in public education and outreach, uh, including a webinar on faith and community-based approaches to prisoner reentry, um, which featured the DPC's Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships Office. Uh, that forum engaged over 1,000 stakeholders. Uh, and alongside that, we also continue to participate in other convenings, uh, including the Health and Human Services Conference um, organized by Linda, who's on the panel here, and others. Uh, that's the sort of outreach and education that we've been involved in historically and, and hope to be involved in going forward as well. Um, we have really been pleased to be engaged actively on all those fronts uh, and, and are looking forward to the continued partnership here. Uh, just to preview quickly three other areas, and then we should dive really into the heart of, of the plenary discussion here. Uh, there are several areas where DPC is hoping to, uh, one, uh, be engaged and to explore further. One such area is the availability of federal resources for children whose parents are incarcerated. Reportedly, more than 7 million children in the, in the United States have a parent currently in the criminal justice system. Uh, that number, from my perspective, is just staggering, uh, so much so that I've had two separate folks in our office check it independently because I just could not believe that that, that number was accurate. Uh, apart from that, um, our Government Accountability Office recently reported that as of 2007, an estimated 1.7 million children under the age of 18 had a parent in prison. Uh, that's an increase of almost 80% since 1991. Again, uh, a horrifically staggering number. Alongside those statistics, the number of incarcerated mothers more than doubled during that time, which, uh, at least as a policy matter, has massive consequences, uh, including, not, not least of which, is because incarcerated mothers also were more likely to be primary caretakers before incarceration. Uh, and I could, could go on. There's a similar GAO study that suggests that at least 8% of kids who are in foster care now are there um, because they have a parent who is incarcerated. Uh, we know that parents who go to prison um, do not suffer the consequences alone. The children of incarcerated parents lose contact with their parents. Uh, visits are sometimes rare. Uh, following release, both parents and children face challenges in reuniting and supporting their families. Uh, the collateral consequences of a parent's incarceration really are tremendous. And the White House, recognizing that reality, is looking forward to partnering with our agency colleagues here as well as stakeholders and experts uh, who are really focused on these issues and um, many of whom are convened here today to better understand and address the needs of children with incarcerated parents. Uh, a second priority area for us, we are, are very much interested in ensuring a continuum of essential health care following an individual's release from prison. 
Uh, we've heard from practitioners and community health workers about the challenges of reentry when former offenders reenter communities and lack adequate access to care uh, and adequate access to treatment upon their release. The consequences of interrupted care are especially profound among individuals with HIV and AIDS, but um, frankly, it's a problem across the population of offenders who are reentering our communities. And we have a team within the DPC uh, that is uh, actually teams in the plural in DPC that are focused both on the broad set of health issues, but then separately on the special issues that impact individuals with HIV and AIDS. Um, I know that uh, Linda's colleagues at Health and Human Services, um, Amy and Marlene's colleagues at the Justice Department, and several other agencies have focused really like a laser on this challenge. And we are looking forward to that continued work and that continued partnership. Um, one, as we evaluate um, the results of what I understand is a Medicaid pilot program focused on precisely that, um, but also as we think strategically about uh, the measure of education and outreach uh, that should be done in connection with the expanded coverage uh, made possible by the Affordable Care Act. Uh, concerted efforts from our perspective uh, to guarantee this continuum of care for offenders uh, could yield substantial benefits in terms of reduced recidivism, improved public health, um, not to mention the cost savings, and, and the White House is eager to help amplify that effort. Uh, and then one final issue, and I will uh, let us move on with the program, are just the broad set of access to justice issues. It really is impossible for us to mention um, all the, the subsets of this broader uh, broader set of policy concerns that uh, the DPC and the White House are concerned about. We have really leaned um, heavily on the good work that's coming out of the Reentry Council to direct us appropriately, but I, I did want to mention the access to justice questions, uh, issues that I know the Justice Department has been um, squarely focused on, and the Labor Department has been involved in this question, and I discovered, um, by virtue of having participated in the Reentry Council meeting, that the Veterans Administration also is looking at this question more closely as well. Uh, in April, the White House House and the Legal Services Corporation convened a forum on the state of civil legal assistance um, where both the President and the Attorney General uh, addressed what was a broadly diverse audience of national leaders in this space. Uh, there, the President made clear that making civil legal assistance available to low-income Americans uh, is, uh, and I quote, central to our notion of equal justice under the law. And there, he pledged to be a fierce defender and advocate for legal services. Uh, for me, that pledge necessarily includes the provision of legal services to reentering offenders, uh, uh, primarily uh, reentering offenders who are indigent and need help navigating the many, uh, and as I think you might learn during the presentation, sometimes unfounded um, barriers to reentry. Uh, uh, I know the Access to Justice Initiative of the Justice Department has, has been doing this good work. The Department of Labor has been involved. Again, the VA has been engaged as well. Uh, and we are similarly focused on living up uh, to the President's pledge uh, and by enabling low-income individuals to access legal services, ensuring uh, that any collateral consequences on people um, with cr criminal records, for example, are appropriately tailored. Uh, Thank you again for uh, your important services in this area. Um, thank you um, for allowing me to offer a few remarks. I am looking forward to this panel, um, probably as much as you are. Um, uh, and and uh, if anything, I should just again reiterate that uh, at least I and my colleagues at the White House um, really remain committed and are looking forward to the partnership going forward. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, now I want to introduce the panel to you. We have uh, incredible representation of my federal government colleagues. And I want to tell you uh, of what they'll talk about uh, very briefly. So we're going to start off uh, with uh, Amy Solomon, my colleague at the Department of Justice, who's going to give a brief introduction to the Reentry Council's work. Then we have uh, Ron Ashford from Housing and Urban Development. We'll talk about housing barriers. Next, we'll have Todd Cox from the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission talking about employer responsibilities. And we heard a little bit about some news from EEOC this morning. Next, we'll have Greg Welts from the Department of Labor speaking about employer incentives. 
Linda Melgren from the Department of Health and Human Services will talk about access to benefits and treatment. And Sean Clark from the Department of Veterans Affairs will talk about assistance to veterans. As if that weren't enough, uh, we have a number of our colleagues uh, sitting down in the audience because we didn't have enough room up here on the stage. And uh, they're going to be available to answer your questions. I just would like them to stand. John Linton from the Department of Education, Pamela Lawrence from HUD, Angela Klein and Stephanie Davis from the Agriculture Department, Jerry Flavin from the uh, Small Business Administration, Malenka Clark from DOJ's Access to Justice, Tom Murphy, Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Office, Gary Dennis and Thurston Bryant from Bureau of Justice Assistance, and Eugene, Eugene Schneeberg from the Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships Office. So hopefully we'll finish in time. All these people will be available to answer your questions. So we'll start off with Amy. Good afternoon. Impressed. Everyone made it back on time from lunch. That was great. We're so glad to have this panel and also I just want to say thank you too. We're so glad to have this new White House uh, partner in Tanya Robinson. So before I get into what the camp council is doing, I want to tell you a bit about why we came into being. <clears throat> why would all of these cabinet secretaries come together? Do we need another government group? Uh, we think we did. The first reason is because there was actually an intent in early versions of the Second Chance Act uh, for this kind of interagency task force. Uh, the congressional sponsors saw a need for enhanced coordination in this area. Second, all of us in this big room know that this is a multifaceted problem and requires a multifaceted solution involving many partner agencies. That's true at the federal level, just as it is at the state level and the local levels. So at the federal level, there's a recognition that this population is one we're already all working with, not only in our prisons, jails, and juvenile facilities, but in our emergency rooms, in homeless shelters, in the veterans' hospitals, unemployment lines, the child support offices, and elsewhere. And when we extend out to the children and the families of incarcerated, uh, that intersect is even greater. And so by working together, we do hope that we can achieve uh, bigger outcomes, not only in terms of public safety, but also in terms of public health and child welfare, employment, education, and other key outcomes. So as a corollary to that, uh, the federal agencies also recognize that many of us were investing in this area. And the formation of a council gives us a more systematic way uh, to share information, to coordinate our resources, and to align our policies. The fourth bullet here is leadership, and our hope is that a high-level and broad-ranging council can be a model, particularly for jurisdictions uh, that are new to this area. But finally, and I think most importantly, we know that even the best programs and the most motivated individuals can't be successful when there are blocks that are broad to employment, to housing, to benefits, and to other areas, to other key resources. So we're working together to reduce barriers to reentry. We're trying to use all the federal tools in our toolbox to get there, and that's where we're focusing most of our area, most of our energies. So here's a photo from our first reentry council meeting that the Attorney General convened in January of 2011. Uh, there were seven cabinet secretaries at the table focusing on this issue that we care so much about as well as other administration leaders. And it was a remarkable meeting. Every agency saw their part of the problem in this issue and was coming up with creative solutions to address it. At this first meeting, the council adopted a mission statement to make communities safer, to assist people coming out of prisons and jails to be productive citizens, and to save taxpayer dollars in this area. The council also empowered staff, which now represent 20 federal agencies, to work towards a number of goals. They agreed to meet twice a year, and the Attorney General just convened the third meeting of the Council about 10 days ago. I can flip through the next couple slides. This is our alphabet soup uh, of agencies that are on the Reentry Council, and we've learned each one really has a unique role to play in this area. And I'll just note that the um, Small Business Administration on the bottom 
Wright is our latest and 20th agency to join the council. And uh, we're so pleased that they're a part of this because they're providing new languages to small business networks, to microloan opportunities, and to entrepreneurship training. So Marlene, these next two slides I've included as reference. Um, our mission, our goals, they'll be a part of the PowerPoint that's available on the uh, flash drive. And I want to talk about how we're organizing our work. Uh, we're organizing around the three ways that we think we can make a difference. One is by coordinating and leveraging the resources that are already going to the field from our agencies. The second way is by removing federal barriers to reentry. And the third is using the bully pulpit to advance the reentry agenda for a broad number of audiences. So in terms of coordinating resources, our starting point was really to inventory the resources that were going to the field. And so uh, we, have, we mapped out, and actually our colleagues at the National Reentry Resource Center put this information into an interactive map, all of the grants that are coming from labor and justice and, and education and the rest to states and localities. So you can now go to this map, you can click on your state, and you can see all of the grants that are in play locally. And we think that in this economic climate, it's important for us and it's important for you to be able to access and see what resources are working in this space, that we can leverage what we've got and make the most of them. We're doing other things to coordinate our uh, across agencies, too. We're co-investing in areas with uh, solicitations that crosswalk our issues, health and justice, fatherhood, housing, and reentry. We've created a network of researchers uh, across the various agencies who are beginning to share findings and think about those implications for our policies and our programs. We're focusing on uh, populations that cross-cut our agencies, juveniles, uh, fathers, females, tribes, and the federal population that come with their unique challenges and opportunities. And uh, as we've just heard from Tanya, we will be focusing our attention on children incarcerated, which are so deeply impacted by this issue. And we're also coordinating in practical ways, like this conference, expanding out beyond the justice and second chance grantees. Um, and as you'll hear from Linda, we're trying to begin to orient and educate our federal colleagues at the state and regional levels so that they're better equipped to help you. In terms of barriers to reentry, uh, we're honing in on barriers to employment and education, to public housing, and to federal benefits such as TANF, Social Security, food assistance, and veterans benefits that can help stabilize this population after release. We're really trying to uh, help figure out how to set up benefits for people before they're released so that there's no gap when they do get out. Uh, that's where we're focusing in a lot of our efforts here. And finally, uh, we are trying to use the bully pulpit, the voice of our leaders, and the power of persuasion to bring these issues and potential solutions to light. So the Attorney General and the Cabinet Secretaries are out there talking about this issue, holding meetings and events, they're writing to their colleagues, and they're reaching out to stakeholders in all of our disciplines. We've also developed a website which is housed on the National Reentry Resource Center website, which has access to all the materials that we'll discuss today. And we've developed what we call Mythbusters, which are one-pagers designed to clarify existing policies and point people to resources that can be helpful. So we're really trying to bring clarity and transparency to the vast web of federal resources that impact this population. So the Mythbusters, you can click forward a couple. Um, they look like this next slide. They're one page. Again, they're all on the flash drive you've got. And uh, we've got 22 of them now. If you can just hit the next one. And they're tackling issues um, that are varied. We've got five unemployment barriers that tackle both em employment incentives uh, for employers and employer responsibilities and workers' rights. We've got 10 focused on the various uh, federal benefits. And then we've got others that touch on juvenile issues, on voting rights, on parental rights, on child support, and other issues. And we recognize that these MythBusters don't change policy. They don't solve all of our problems. But in many cases, uh, they're accessible, and they're an important first step to tackling the issues we're working on together. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ron Ashford, who's going to talk about barriers to housing. 
Are you serious? I want, I want to start off by saying I've been in federal government 15 years, right? And I worked with this group and that group and interagency. This is the first interagency group that actually does stuff, that produces stuff, that's making a change. And that's because of Amy Solomon. Amy Solomon is the one who brought us together, who keeps us together, who pushes things forward. It's, uh, it's Amy Solomon. So <clears throat> public housing. If I were, you know how sometimes you have those little things that you vote on? You know, little, um, I don't know what, what they are. And if I were to ask you, according to HUD, <clears throat> who is barred from public housing? And I were to say those convicted of drug offenses, right? It would probably be 80%, you know? Yes, they're barred. Uh, someone who 20 years ago committed murder, and it would be 70%, right? And that's wrong. That is not what HUD says. So the, the impetus was, the, the push to us was, let's clarify what it is that HUD actually says. And what HUD actually says is that there's two categories of folks who are barred from public housing. One, makers of methamphetamine, and two, if you're on the sexual predator list. That's all. Everything else is up to the local housing authority. And I want to give credit to our secretary because we had drafted a letter that was supposed to go out to housing authorities that clarified the policy. And the secretary looked at it, and, he, and actually there was a picture of the first reentry council meeting, and he read the letter there. And on the ride back to HUD, he said, you know what? I don't think this works. I think clarifying the policy only goes halfway. And so what was added to that letter is, we encourage housing authorities to be expansive in their policies where appropriate. That's what the letter says. So that letter, every housing authority across America has that letter. Does that move housing authorities to open up? Not necessarily. That's the task of you and us, right? And, and to get there, I think we have to understand why a lot of housing authorities are reluctant to go down this road. One is because other residents don't necessarily want ex-offenders back in. I don't want this guy who is dealing drugs back in my development living next door to me. The other is what I call a fear of a headline. And it's a, it's a federal government thing, it's an executive thing. If I let this guy back in and something bad happens, I'm out of a job, right? So housing authorities are reluctant to go down this road without knowing that there's someone out there who's providing case management services, who's providing job training services, who's providing counseling services, who's providing an array of services so that the returning offender has a safety net. And his choice in terms of going down this road is a safe choice. That is you. That is you. You are the ones who have that ability to provide that safety net. And I would actually encourage, we're doing, you know, we're doing our bit from HUD, saying, okay, housing authorities, you can be expansive. Housing authorities, you can go in this direction, but they need assurances. And I posited this a couple of times to conferences. I was in LA, and I said, you know, there, there were like lots of community-based organizations there, and I said, if you got together and drafted a plan as to how you were going to provide those services, the case management, and that safety net to ex-offenders, and went to the public housing director and said, you know, we got your back. You know, if you make a move in this direction, we will be there to help you out. And that's what I encourage you to do on the ground. I can't tell a housing authority what to do, but I can open that door. So if you're in Wichita and you want to talk to the housing authority and you want to uh, meet and discuss ways that you can work together to get the ex-offenders back in, I can call the Wichita housing authority director and at least open that door for that meeting because we need you if we're going to move this thing further down the line. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. More than 
of collateral consequences have to do with uh, barriers to employment. And we know that in this economy, with unemployment as high as it is, this population is particularly impacted. Uh, there are significant economic impacts and societal costs associated with unsuccessful reentry. And we also know that what some of the best predictors of success is full employment and stable employment. So we're taking action on this, uh, on this front, as Amy alluded to. And I'd like to update you today on four areas. A um, couple of updates from EEOC and other updates from uh, our other fe federal colleagues uh, on the Reentry Council. First, as many of you have heard, um, in a four to one bipartisan vote, the EEOC approved and issued updated guidance on the use of criminal records in employment. Now, the Commission met publicly to discuss this issue in 2008 and also in July uh, 2011. And from those meetings, as well as uh, the testimony from those meetings, including testimony from some of our reentry colleagues, Amy Solomon and Rob Schreiber for OPM in particular, um, and hundreds of written comments, uh, over 300, helped the Commission uh, come to uh, con uh, consider these issues and to revise the existing guidance is originally issued in 1987 and 1990. The updated guidance clarifies and updates uh, the agency's long-standing standing policy concerning the use of criminal records in employment and how disparate treatment and disparate impact um, would function in, in that context. So let's talk a little bit about exactly how this information can be used in a discriminatory way. First, um, uh, the relevant law, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, prohibits employers from treating em job applicants or employees with the same criminal records different because of their race, national origin, or other protected characteristic. In other words, you can't intentionally discriminate based on race or national origin using a criminal record in employment. The second way that um, this information can be used in a potentially discriminatory way is through disparate impact. This means that if a criminal records exclusion operates to disproportionately exclude people of color or of a particular race or national origin, the employer has to show that the exclusions are what we call job related and consistent with business necessity under Title VII. And what that means, the exclusion has to be connected to the job that you're applying for. And the next question usually is, well, how does an employer prove this? Well, first of all, the first point I want to make is not, it's not at all burdensome. Um, and there are really two ways that an employer can show that, um, that they're that they not uh, screening in a discriminatory way. First, they must uh, consider at least the nature of the crime, the time elapsed since the crime uh, was con uh, uh, criminal conduct occurred, and the nature of the specific job in question, what we call the green factors. They must consider all of those things uh, before they exclude a job applicant. And then finally, they should give the applicant who is excluded uh, the opportunity to show why he should not be excluded. In other words, we encourage through our guidance an individualized assessment where uh, in, uh, job applicants or current workers are given an opportunity to explain how um, the, 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 uh, the criminal conduct should not exclude them from a job. The other update I want to talk about is um, the EEOC and Pepsi settlement um, that, that we re entered into over the summer. Um, we had found reasonable cause to believe that uh, the criminal background check uh, used, that was formerly used by the Pepsi company discriminated against African Americans in violation of Title VII, as we just discussed before. The, the really significant part of this is not, a, not only did Pepsi agree to pay relief, uh, revise its policy, provide job offers, and, connect, and, con and conduct training, it also allowed the settlement to be made public, which is the first one of this type um, in this area. And th that uh, giving us permission to make this public, uh, we're grateful that they did that, allows us an opportunity to use it and to have this, this conversation that we're having today and really use it as an example of how employers can um, reduce and eliminate unnecessary barriers to employment for this population. The other update I want to talk about is um, the Fair Credit Reporting Act. And that's a, an act that's enforced and handled by the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, who created, I guess, a relatively new mythbuster, one of the five that Amy mentioned, concerning the role of criminal records and employment and credit. Uh, the, myth the myth buster they developed uh, around FICRA, which is the Federal Credit Reporting Act, makes it clear that employers must get your permission, usually in writing, before asking for a criminal history report when you're applying for a job. If you give that permission and you're denied the opportunity for employment, uh, there are a number of steps that the employer must take uh, after that, including giving you a copy of the report. And we can talk more about this either through the question and answer period or during the workshops later on. Uh, the FTC is also very helpfully or has helpfully developed an online guidance in this area to help employers understand their responsibilities uh, under FICRA. And finally, I want to update you on uh, work from our OPM colleagues concerning federal employment. 
The Office of uh, Personnel Management, OPM, has developed a MythBuster concerning the federal hiring and the use of criminal records. And the bottom line is that the federal government does not have an overarching policy that precludes employing people with criminal records from all positions. And this is consistent with our guidance. Uh, we have a section in our guidance where we talk about federal employment and how uh, they also go through a searching individualized assessment. In other words, you must consider the criminal record within context of the job that's being applied for. In this spirit, OPM is taking a close look at its current regulations concerning su suitability evaluations, in other words, the evaluations that federal agencies go through to assess whether or not you're appropriate for the job, to make sure that their federal hiring is, co is consistent with our updated guidance. Also, OPM is developing a best practice guide uh, on the use of criminal records in hiring for those employing people outside of the usual area that OPM covers, in other words, contract employers, uh, employees and employers who are usually uh, missed during this process. Thank you for your time and look forward to your questions. Good afternoon, how are you? Good afternoon. Very well orchestrated coming up here, one after the next. I have to uh, follow up on my comment, uh, the comment that my colleague Ron made, uh, which is that being part of this group is actually very extraordinary. And if you hear enough of us say that we actually think we get something done, you might actually believe us. So second person, maybe a third or fourth, will follow after me. Um, I'm here from the Department of Labor, specifically the Employment and Training Administration. Um, and so I'm going to talk to you about a number of things. I'm going to first talk a little bit about uh, things that came out of our Mythbuster series, and then I'm going to go on and talk about some of our resources, and then finish with uh, some upcoming guidance that our workforce system is going to be receiving from the Employment and Training Administration. Um, as you are program operators, working with individuals, citizens trying to return to your communities, you have a really, really tough task in helping these individuals get into employment. We know what the labor market looks like. We know the challenges that go on top of that for people who have criminal backgrounds. So you need every single tool that you can possibly have in the book. And so two things I want to talk about. The first is the federal bonding program. And the second is the work opportunity tax credit. And when I talk about this, I like to frame this as this isn't your leading salvo if you're a program operator and you're working with uh, individuals and you're working with employers and businesses, I wouldn't open with, if you hire this individual, you'll get a work opportunity tax credit, or if you hire this individual, we'll be able to, fet we'll be able to bond them. What I like to think of these as is deal closers or overcoming objections. And how many of you here have ever worked with an individual returning to their community and have heard the objections before? Raise your hand. Okay, so this is, a, this is an audience grounded in reality. So hopefully what you hear today about these two incentives will be more tools in your, in your toolbox. The first is the uh, federal bonding program, which is basically a fid fidelity bond to ensure the truthfulness and uh, the individual will not do something that will harm the business or the employer for which they are working. Um, and they're used for a lot of different hard-to-place individuals, not necessarily only ex-offenders. However, 90% of the federal bonds that have been used have been used for individuals who have a previous arrest and conviction record. Since 1966, which is when the Department of Labor, the only federal uh, agency that offers the bonds, began issuing bonds, over 47,000 bonds have been issued. And I think what's pretty amazing is that we can um, talk about a success rate of 99%. So in terms of actual claims against the bonds, it's very low. And I would say that because it's done in partnership with organizations and services and community uh, operators like yourselves who are there to provide those additional supports, that, again, it's a deal closer. It's not, it's not the, what's going to make it happen. The occupations for which the federal bonding uh, are most co commonly used include construction, janitorial work, pest control, hospitality, landscaping, retail, and restaurant work. Now, how do you get a federal bond? The way they work is that um, they cost about $98 for uh, six months 
and that gets up to $5,000 in fidelity insurance. And um, they can actually be coupled, so you can go up to $25,000 a bond, so you just add to the cost. They are actually distributed by the Department of Labor a certain number to each of the state workforce agencies. We issue what's called floor bonds, which allows those bonds to be issued at no cost to the state to almost create an incentive to use these. Most states use those up quickly, but in some states they don't. So there's opportunities for you to work with the states. Every state participates, except three, uh, Virginia, Nevada, and Kentucky, and every state has a federal bond coordinator who works with the one-stop career centers to distribute and to sell bonds. You as an organization can also work directly with the federal bonding program, which is contracted by the Department of Labor. And uh, on the Mythbuster, which you should all have access to, there is a website. I'm not going to give the website today, but the website is on the, the Mythbuster, and you can get more information at that. The second incentive is the Work Opportunity Tax Credit. And the Work Opportunity Tax Credit uh, is something that's been renewed by Congress in successive appropriation years. And um, to give you an example of how often it's used, there were roughly 850,000 certifications issued by state workforce agencies in fiscal year 2010. So it's not a hidden tool. It's something that is used, um, but it can be used more. And let me talk a little bit about what it does. Uh, generally, for the ex-offender population, it's going to be a $2,400 credit per employee that falls under the category. And the category, there are roughly, there are nine categories of job seekers, and uh, one of them being ex-felon. And it's defined as an individual who has convicted of a felon, who was convicted of a felony, and who was hired within, within one year after the conviction or release from prison. So what does an employer have to do? Employer has to make the hiring decision, which is part of that process that you as the organization bringing forth and working with uh, the individual have to make happen first. Secondly, they have to complete minimal paperwork to claim the tax credit, and they can hire as many new individuals who qualify for these tax savings. Um, so there's lots of opportunity if you have a number of individuals that you're working with and you have an employer that's very uh, friendly to your organization, it's not just for the first one, it's for every individual who qualifies. And then lastly, what I want you to know is that um, there are state workforce agency workforce opportunity tax credit coordinators in every single state in the United States. And uh, the Employment and Training Administration has a info fact sheet on our website and the, the um, information fact sheet um, uh, web address is also included in the Mythbuster. Okay, I want to turn now and talk a little bit about Department of Labor resources that are resources that assist individuals returning from prison to re-enter and get employment. The first is our national formula grant program, which is basically the, the infrastructure of the public workforce system. Uh, every state has a different name. Uh, some of them, some states are called work, work system connections and other states are called the One Stop Career Center. Um, and these are places that have both information and services available and they provide services to youth, adults, and dislocated workers. The second is our competitive grant program, which primarily falls under the reintegration of ex-offender funding. Um, for fiscal year 2011, there are two specific funding streams from re reintegration of ex-offenders going towards adult offenders. The first is our reintegration of ex-offenders adult generation five. This is a grant program that's been in existence since 2006 and that's roughly $20 million. Um, we are prepared shortly to make awards for that grant competition. The second is uh, a new grant competition that's focused on individuals who have characteristics common to female ex-offenders, and that will be both adult and youth, depending on the applications that we receive, and funds for that will also be awarded before June 30. And then lastly, we have two others that focus primarily on older youth 
One is called Training and Service Learning, which gives youth an opportunity to work and uh, work together on community service projects. And then lastly, an intermediary grants program that would make grants to large organizations that have footprints in multiple states to also provide reentry services to older uh, reentering youth. A couple things I just want to mention about things that we've learned over the years and some changes. Uh, in 2011, our applicant pool or eligible, eligible participants has increased. We've included ex-offenders with violent um, and uh, violent history in their past. This previously were, were they were previously excluded, and we've also ex included uh, ex-offenders with sexual offenses. You ask why? Um, one, we heard a lot of feedback over the years that it makes it difficult for community-based organizations and state corrections to work together because a lot of the individuals returning from state corrections have some violent crime uh, uh, arrest in their in their background. Um, Secondly, there are tools that help to determine through risk whether an individual will be successful, and third, for obvious civil rights purposes. Um, secondly, uh, we have recently in our solicitations included legal services. Um, Tanya mentioned legal services as a priority of the president. Um, so funds from the Department of Labor can be used for some legal services to either make re referrals or pay for services such as securing a driver's license, expunging criminal records, or creating or modifying child support orders. Um, and then lastly, the Department of Labor is in the process of doing a random assignment evaluation of the first generation of the adult reintegration ex-offender program. Um, this is actually a very consequential evaluation. Uh, we have over 4,600 individuals in the evaluation, of which 2,800 are in the program group. So because we have such large, large numbers, we're hoping that we'll be able to pick up um, small, if not hopefully large, impacts that might exist at a statistically significant level. Uh, we look forward to having results for that um, sometime next year. And then lastly, I wanted to mention that um, we are in the process, I mentioned our public workforce system, and our public workforce system does a lot around providing labor market information and providing job postings to individuals who are seeking employment. We are in the process right now, we've been working very closely with the EEOC, with the Department of Justice Civil Rights Center, and our Civil Rights Center at the Department of Labor to put out guidance uh, around employer job postings that contain hiring exclusions or restrictions based on arrest and conviction records. This guidance we hope will be coming out soon and will really help to reinforce things that Todd talked about today and to make sure that ex-offender barriers related to access to jobs are removed as much as possible. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Um, my colleagues from HUD and from Labor and from the EEOC have been able to give you uh, some detail about the efforts that are going on in housing and employment uh, efforts. Um, I have the task of doing a very quick review of things that are happening across a lot of different programs. Um, and I don't know if I got that job because I speak fast or because the Department of Health and Human Services has so many component pieces that they figure I already know how to juggle a lot of things. But anyway, so we're, here, it, here it is, uh, just a very quick review of some of the other places where we are doing work to clarify um, what uh, benefits are available to people who are coming out of prison, um, some of the work that's going on in some of the other program areas, and then, as Amy said, to talk uh, very briefly about a communication strategy that we're trying to put in place. 
Uh, the first myth buster we want to just mention um, is that a person with a criminal record is not eligible to receive um, student financial aid. Um, that's a belief that a lot of people have. It's not true. There are a few restrictions, but once somebody gets out of prison, all of the programs that uh, the Department of Education has, with just a couple of tiny exceptions, are available to those folks. Um, the Department of, of Education hasn't stopped with making that clarification, however. They are now working on a number of special efforts, um, but one of them that I think is really exciting is that they are really trying to make a connection between the education that is happening within prison with educational opportunities that are happening outside of prison so that, you, so that when somebody leaves prison, that doesn't stop the educational trajectory. We really think that is important. Um, another myth is that um, Social Security benefits uh, can't be reinstated when an individual is released from incarceration. Again, that is not true. Um, if somebody had been receiving disability benefits or retirement benefits, those benefits can be reinstated upon release. If somebody had been receiving SSI, um, there is a process that has to be gone through, but those benefits can be reinstated. There is no prohibition against those benefits based on a criminal records. Um, our friends at Social Security are doing some exciting things around this area. They have uh, revised their guidance and have gotten it out to all of their field staff so they understand what the rules are. And they are working on developing a page on their website that is specifically targeted uh, to this population so that all the complicated rules and regulations um, around uh, getting Social Security benefits for this population will be in one place. Another myth has to do with the area of, of child support. Um, there are some folks who believe that non-custodial parents who are incarcerated cannot get their child support reduced. 20 years ago, that was pretty much true in all, that, all the states. Now many, many states have changed their policies and make it possible for there to be prospective modification of child support orders. What prospective means is that you can't reduce what is already owed, but you can change the amount going forward. Um, the president has included in his budget a provision that basically says um, that no state should, in fact, be able to, um, to consider incarceration to be voluntary unemployment. That's sort of a way of saying uh, nobody made you uh, commit this crime, so just because you're not working uh, doesn't mean that you shouldn't continue to owe the same child support that you did when you were working. Um, there would be a revision to the law that would not allow any state uh, to consider that. That is under consideration. It hasn't been passed yet, but it has been in the president's budget. But more than that, the child support program is working with all of the uh, reentry council agencies to find better ways to disseminate information about the child support program through a variety of vehicles so that people know what they can do and what they can't do in regard to their child support. Another myth is that child welfare agencies are required to terminate parental rights if a parent is incarcerated. Um, there are provisions, there is a law that basically says that you are to consider, you know, a, a long absence as part of the um, criteria for looking at whether or not parental rights should be terminated so a child can be released for adoption. But every state has the ability to um, do planning for these children and to um, change, uh, you know, to have discretion so that they don't automatically terminate parental rights. Um, this provision and others like it will be part of the work that the, uh, the folks that are interested in the children of incarcerated parents will be looking at to see, you know, what additional kind of guidance can we give the states in this area. 
Another place um, where there's a lot of misunderstanding is that parents with a felony conviction cannot receive uh, TANF or welfare benefits. It is true that there are some prohibitions, um, but they only apply to people with a drug felony convictions, and states can, in fact, take action that would then allow folks to receive TANF benefits. And most states have. Only 11 states have left this prohibition in place. All the other states have either um, wiped it out uh, in its entirety or have uh, modified, it, modified the ban in some kind of way. This provision obviously might apply to men or women, but there is a working group underway um, based on a conference that was held this, this winter on women and reentry that is going to be looking at all of the policies and the programs and practices um, that affect women who are coming out of prison and jail and how we can approve access to benefits for those folks. Just like with the TANF benefits, there are prohibitions in the SNAP program, formerly food stamps, around uh, convicted felons receiving those benefits. Again, they only apply to drug felonies. And like with TANF, most, most states have eliminated or modified the ban. Um, Another program area where there's a lot of, uh, has been a lot of misunderstanding is that Medicaid agencies are required to terminate benefits um, if an otherwise eligible individual is incarcerated. Um, this is not true. Um, it is true that Medicaid will not pay for services delivered to someone in prison. Next slide. Okay. Um, but it isn't true that benefits have to be terminated. They can be suspended so that they can be easily reinstated when somebody is released from prison. Um, there's a lot of work going on in this area, as Tanya mentioned. Um, a lot of interest in how we can get better health care for people who are leaving prison and jail. Um, um, we, we, HHS, are collaborating with the um, National Institute of Corrections on a project that is about getting eligibility, getting people applications for Medicaid benefits while they're in prison and, and in jail, and then testing out, you know, how does that affect their access to care, their access to employment, and their recidivism rates? That project's been in place for about uh, less than a year. We've got a couple of years to go, but we hope as a part of this project we'll be able to identify some good procedures for enrolling folks in Medicaid while they are still um, in prison or jail. Um, our colleagues in SAMHSA are also moving forward uh, looking at the behavioral health issues as they relate to health care for folks coming out of prison. They have an exciting project underway um, with the MacArthur Foundation where they are providing funds in a couple of states um, to work on issues related to juveniles that have behavioral health issues and finding new ways to keep them out of the juvenile justice system. So we've got a lot of a lot of things um, underway in terms of improving access to benefits. Um, but one of the things that we recognized as we make all of these changes and clarifications, um, we have learned that as the working group of the council, we learn a lot from each other. Um, we, we go to meetings, we find out what's allowable, what's not allowable, we tell our colleagues. Um, but not everybody has the opportunity to sort of have that kind of close working relationship. And there are a lot of federal staff throughout um, the United States um, that don't get to meet with each other regularly. Um, and so one of the things that we did is we looked at how the different federal agencies were organized and realized that, you know, at the the non 
Washington, D.C. level, it was much harder for federal staff to be in communication with each other and much harder for them to be in communication with the states. So we've created a directory of federal staff who have some responsibility for reentry or have knowledge of program rules and regulations that can be helpful um, to spreading the, the correct information about what um, is possible to do through federal programs. And that information is currently being spread out to the regional offices and to the state reentry coordinators so that there can be better communication uh, around the changes that are taking place. Um, in the world of reentry. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, veterans are a, a, a comparatively small uh, portion of the American population, um, but it's important to note, and this is a it's also important to advance the slides. It's important to note that in the criminal justice system, they do make up a significant uh, portion of the population at, at any point you, you, you choose to look at. Um, this was a number that surprised me, but the, the best data that we have from the Bureau of Justice Statistics at DOJ indicates that about 10% is a rule of thumb, give or take a percentage point. Uh, of any criminal justice population that you look at. So reentry included, certainly, but also including at the point of arrest uh, and incarceration, community supervision as well, are individuals who've served in the military. So they're a minority, to be sure, uh, but they're a significant part of, of any criminal justice population um, veterans are. To that end, um, VA, and um, as the background uh, for what I'll talk about, these four points here, has been operating two justice-focused outreach programs for the past uh, five years in one case and three years in the second. The first uh, provides outreach to veterans who are coming out of state and federal prison. It's called Healthcare for Reentry Veterans. There are 44 individuals around the country and we're in more than three quarters uh, of all the state and federal prisons. I've seen more than 40,000 veterans at this point. The second is Veterans Justice Outreach, and this is focused on the front end of the criminal justice system, going into jail facilities uh, to work with veterans, doing reentry planning, um, providing outreach and help with training to law enforcement locally, uh, and working with uh, treatment courts, uh, including um, prominently the Veterans Treatment Courts, a new model that you may have heard of. So a bit of background uh, on the two programs that VA runs. Um, I would encourage you, uh, if you don't know, uh, who the Veterans Justice Outreach Specialist at the nearest VA Medical Center is, uh, or if you don't know who the Healthcare for Reentry Veterans Specialist serving your area is, uh, that you take a look at our Mythbusters, um, the Veterans Health uh, Mythbuster that's available on your, your flash drive, um, and the website uh, listed for us on there has contact information for both of them. I'd really encourage you to get in touch. So on to the news, uh, the headlines here, uh, as it were. Um, some of the work that VA has been doing um, to enhance um, the reentry experience uh, for veterans uh, coming out of the criminal justice system. Earlier access to incarceration. There's a VHA story here and a VBA story. The Veterans Health Administration, the largest integrated health system in the United States, uh, 153 hospitals, a number of other facilities uh, of different types, uh, providing the full spectrum of healthcare services uh, to eligible veterans. Um, these are the facilities um, that our outreach specialists work out of and their function, it's obviously outreach isn't an end in itself. The point is linking them back to services at those medical facilities once they've been released uh, from incarceration. The VBA meaning of earlier access to incarcerated veterans, as you may or may not know, uh, if a veteran has been incarcerated for longer than six months, the odds are very good that he or she has temporarily lost eligibility for the monetary benefits that are administered by the Veterans Benefits Administration. Most often these come in the form of compensation payments for service-connected disabilities uh, or pension payments um, that, are, that, are, that are means based. Um, 
the VBA news in this, in this regard is that veterans can now apply prior to their release to have these benefits reinstated um, so that their, the resumption of their income comes closer to the point of release uh, in recognition of, of how critical a time uh, those first 30, 60 days uh, can be to getting back on your feet. Uh, healthcare and community correction settings. This was a case that until about a year ago, uh, veterans all too often fell between the cracks um, when they moved into uh, community correction settings, halfway houses, reentry uh, centers, work release centers. They were incarcerated um, for, within VA's definition, of course, they're a patient or inmate of another government agency's institution, and so VA couldn't provide them with health care. As a precondition of getting into that facility, they would have waived their right to health care from Bureau of Prisons, from the state, uh, from whatever authority was incarcerating them. So they were falling between, uh, falling between the cracks and not eligible for care uh, from any easily accessible source. Since April 1st of 2011, those veterans are now eligible for health care from VA. The fact that you're in a halfway house reentry center uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't render you ineligible uh, for our health care. So that's been corrected. Um, another development, we're looking to reach veterans, uh, extend the reach um, of the more than 200 uh, outreach workers uh, that VA has going into these facilities and working with veterans in the community uh, who are involved in the criminal justice system. Uh, we're very excited about the latest one in particular. Um, it is a three-minute video, very short. This was on the advice of our correctional partners, uh, Keep It Short and Sweet. Um, an outreach video that's directed at incarcerated veterans themselves. Um, so in a facility that one of our outreach specialists can't get into uh, or as a preview to his or her visit to that facility, uh, delivering the very simple message, the fact that you're in here doesn't mean uh, that you've lost your eligibility for good for VA health care services. The, our services are available to you when you come out. Not only that, we want to work with you. Let us know how to get in touch with you, how to help you plan for your reentry, uh, and how to help you access the care and the services that you need from us when you come out. Um, that video is called Suits. Again, it's uh, not a big time investment, three minutes. It's also available on the program website uh, in the Mythbuster uh, on your flash drive. Last but not least, uh, to follow up on, on Ms. Robinson's mention of the importance of access to legal services, uh, there are a couple of VA developments uh, on this front. Um, this is certainly something, uh, an issue that Secretary Shinseki is, is, is deeply committed to, getting, helping veterans access legal services uh, for their unmet legal needs. Um, VA is not in a position because it lacks the authority and the staff to provide each of these veterans with an attorney. Uh, but what we can do and are doing uh, is provide space, office space, uh, in the VA medical centers around the country to providers to come in and work with veterans on site. Um, it can help them with a bit of one-stop shopping, getting their medical care, and also uh, effectively going down the hall uh, and, and working with an attorney uh, to, to address their unmet legal needs. We've also, um, and you may have heard of the Supportive Services for Veteran Families program. This is a rapidly growing grant program uh, that VA administers. It's aimed at homeless pre homelessness prevention for veterans and their families. This reflects a, a, a changing uh, focus in VA's approach to homelessness among veterans. The intent here is to stabilize veterans and their families in housing before they become homeless or to rapidly rehouse them if, if they do fall into homelessness. Legal services are an allowable uh, expense uh, for grantees under this program, so they are able to use the funds VA is providing them uh, to cover uh, legal expenses for the veterans uh, who are the beneficiaries of those programs. Uh, that's, that's a significant and recent change and expansion uh, in, in, in the uses of grant funds uh, coming from VA. Uh, so with that, I'll stop, uh, but thanks very much for your time and look forward to hearing from you. Uh, just before we get to questions, um, first of all, I want to call your attention to this. It is going to be on your flash drive, I assume, but these are all the... Uh, uh, things that we talked about in the resources, but I just wanted to mention some anecdotes quickly. You know, uh, Amy and I work together, and we work with a lot of paper. So what? every now and then we get really excited when we hear that this work really translates to the field, and I just want to share a couple with you, and hopefully it will help you in the work you do. Um, for example, we heard that the U.S. attorney in Philadelphia uh, has a reentry program, and there was a gentleman who was sleeping on the church floor, an older gentleman in his 60s who'd come out of prison. And the caseworker said, Is there anywhere where you can go, someone that you can go live with when 
get you out of the shelter and the church floor. And he said, I have a sister in public housing, but they probably wouldn't let me go live with her. So the caseworker took the HUD letter that Ron told you about and went to the local housing authority. And sure enough, that gentleman was allowed to move in with his sister. Now, uh, we also heard about LA, uh, Los Angeles, where because we know there's so many waiting lists for people to get into public housing, Los Angeles has set aside 500 vouchers for um, people coming out of prison to go into the voucher assisted program for HUD. That's the other kind of uh, examples uh, that we're hearing about. In the employment area, uh, I live in Washington, D.C. Many uh, tourists, like yourselves, that come to Washington, you go to e Old Ebbets Grill, which is owned by Clyde's, which has a lot of other um, restaurants in the area. Well, they had a prohibition, no felons need apply. The local supervision agency here took the Pepsi settlement went to Clyde's and said, hey, this is, this is what's going on. Uh, you may want to reconsider your policy. Sure enough, they did. Uh, that's the kind of thing that gets uh, Amy and I excited because we see that this is actually translating. And I'm sure you all have and will have many more stories. And finally, uh, before we get to questions, I want to uh, reemphasize what the Attorney General said this morning about the letter he sent to every state attorney general, asking that state attorney general to take a look at the collateral consequences with an eye toward uh, refining or changing or even reducing some of them. I hope the attorney general's letter is, is uh, on the uh, uh, resource guide here, and I hope that you can be a catalyst in your states to see what has your state attorney general done about this. Uh, I think it gives you an opportunity to approach this issue of collateral consequences. And with that, uh, we're going to turn to questions. It's going to be a little bit difficult. This woman had her hand up first. Please stand up, say your name, what organization, and speak very loudly. Hi, I'm Carol Burton. I'm the Executive Director of Center Force, and I'm with the Alameda County Sheriff's Office uh, in California. My question is both to uh, Ms. Robinson and also uh, Linda. Um, you mentioned that there's lots of work going on with children of incarcerated parents and a movement. I'm, I'm a familiar with the GAO report, but I'm not familiar with anything else. And I've been kind of in this field for a while, and it'd be helpful to know what's going on. Well, I can start by uh, what has been the mind. I can start with what has been kind of my real education around this, and a lot of it has come uh, in, in large measure from, from Linda, so I will defer to her. But uh, uh, because it was a new issue for me, uh, my first request was to try to get my head around what uh, turns out to be uh, not an expansive, but a fairly significant body of literature on the topic, uh, and Linda was kind enough to point us in the right direction. Uh, there's work happening, I think, at the state levels, uh, which we've used as a model as we think about um, how we can contribute in the federal space, and so there is that measure of kind of best practices that are out there. And then apart from that, there are several articles that I think point to uh, the real uh, impact that uh, of having a parent who is incarcerated can have on, on kids and the need to interface because of that significant impact. Uh, within the federal government, what we started with, when I first started uh, back in February or March, uh, there was the GAO report that I, I referenced. There's a second one that speaks to the number of kids who are in foster care. Um, that's a part of what I think uh, Linda and her team and others are, are beginning to think through what an appropriate federal response to that would be. Uh, and then there are a host of articles as well. That's where we started in terms of thinking that this is something that will warrants at least some White House attention and amplification, but, but our effort really is guided by uh, the sort of work that Linda and others are doing in the agencies. Um, I, I, think, I think to put it um, accurately, we have work underway as opposed to work that's been completed. Um, one of the things that we've recognized um, and are really anxious to be working with the White House on is that this is a this is a, a population that we really need to care about, that this is a population that is at risk, at high risk, 
um, for all kinds of, of bad outcomes and that we need to be thinking proactively about how we work with them. And we are putting those processes in place. Um, all of this work takes time because what we're trying to do is work across a complicated federal government structure. There's no agency that, that you know, has on its name, this is the agency that cares about children of incarcerated parents, but everybody has a little piece of the action. So we're really pulling together the, the whole federal government to sort of look at how we can better support those children and those families. So I would tell you to stay tuned, you know, rather than to turn to a particular page or website um, to see what we have been done because it's more in the area of what we're hoping and planning on doing um, for the next short period of time. Just to add briefly, this, this agenda item just came up the last meeting 10 days ago, so it is a new topic for us to undertake, but we will take your recommendations and ideas. In all of these areas, people send us recommendations and ideas. You can send it to any one of us. We share them, we talk about them, we debate them, we get back to you. So if you have uh, tangible recommendations in this area or others, let us know and we'll certainly take it under consideration. Another question? I'm not sure of your last name, Greg, but this question's for you. You, uh, you had stated that there is a, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, my name is Melanie Ditzenberger, I'm from California. I'm with the Alameda County Sheriff's Office. You stated that there was a $2,400 tax credit for employers to, for, as an incentive for um, released inmates. Is there any oversight aside from our case managers um, after the tax credit is, is given to these employers? Because we're at an at, we, we are an at-will state. So after they receive this tax credit, what's to say that they, um, who, who, are there any guidelines to say they, if they let these guys go or fire them? What can we do to, to ensure that they don't? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a great question. Um, my understanding is that there, there are requirements that they have to be employed for a certain amount of time. I don't know the exact amount of time. Um, and this, it's, it's, we, we're in partnership with the IRS, so it's also something that is an auditable issue that shows up on their, on their tax forms. So, um, and their, um, their employer, all of, all of, the, all of the, the, the forms that they submit at the end of the year for, for payroll, et cetera. So um, I have to get you more information on the specifics, but I think that on, on the side of the enforcement side that it becomes an IRS enforcement issue. My second question, I mean, once they get a job, their self-esteem is, is through the roof. But if they're laid off, um, it's going to be down in the dumps, and they're just going to come right back. And we're just going to start that wheel over and over and over again. Um, so it's, it's, it's important to us to understand what we can do um, to counteract that. Hopefully I, you can get me some information soon. There was a question over here. This gentleman. Hi, uh, my name is Joseph White from uh, Utah, Salt Lake City, Utah. We have a reentry program, um, mentoring program. But one of the challenges, we've been doing this for about a year and a half now, and we have uh, guys that will come out, and uh, we've got people, we can line them up with work, we can get things going. I mean, it's hard. But one of the biggest challenges is we can't get them an ID. And the, the State Department of Corrections is it's atrocious. They get out and they give them a, a copy of their prison ID, which nobody will accept to begin with. The ID is a biggest joke. I mean, it would take a couple months for him to get an ID. Some of them, one guy we had to send off to Louisiana to get his birth certificate before he can get his social security number. I mean, it's just a, a, it's a nightmare. So if you have any suggestions about helping them with ID, any of you, I don't know who specific, that would be a great help. I'm having a little trouble. You're asking about an ID coming out of prison? Yeah, helping inmates in a, you know, to get, have an ID before they okay. get released. The Social Security Administration... Uh, uh, unfortunately, they, the gentleman on our reentry council couldn't make it today. They are entering into um, MOUs with state departments of corrections, whereby the Department of Corrections, on behalf of the inmate, can apply for a replacement Social Security card while the person is in prison. So I would get with your, your corrections um, department 
find out if they have an MOU, and if they do, why they're not using it to get these Social Security cards. Hi, my name is Karen McGuire-Hill from Colorado Department of Corrections Division of Education. I have two very quick questions. One of the difficulties I find with the, being the state um, special education director is implementing IDEA in a correctional institution. There's just some, there needs to be some sort of um, modification, I guess, because there are some elements of IDEA that just will not work because you have the security piece of the prison environment versus the you know, the, the IDEA. I, I wonder if, um, I'm asking up here, if we can turn the volume down something we can't hear because of the echo. I can I, put yeah. it away a little bit farther okay. too, Go is ahead. that better? So the first part would be implementing I. Now I'm gone. There, um, the the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act implementing some of those components within the prison environment. There's just some pieces when I report to the state that just don't work, and and I think there needs to be some expansion of IDEA that um, that I guess addresses those issues within a prison environment. The other piece is technology. Um, Colorado has now eight Cisco Network Work Academies within a U.S prison, which is great and phenomenal, but we're having a lot of difficulty with the private industry in, in dealing with the technology once they get outside. These offenders have basically learned how to network and, and function in all these components, but they're not able to touch the internet. And I realize that that is a corrections piece, but with the GED test coming up in 2014 that's computer-based. Um, I just think there needs to be some more incentives to get them up to speed on technology. Do you want to take that? So John Linton down here from education. Um, is, I think that last, yeah, come on up, John. <laughs> well, those are great questions and not so easy to answer. So I'd be glad to talk to you. Uh, IDEA. Uh, implementation and requirements, extremely complicated area, and I'd be, uh, we might even want to follow up uh, post-conference in terms of some calls on that. Uh, on the uh, technology, again, very challenging area, very important area, really relates a lot in terms of uh, individuals really having the skills necessary to succeed in the labor market. And many departments of corrections have restrictions and internet access that really inhibit people being able to develop those practical skills. It's an issue that many Many people are talking about, we haven't really seen uh, tremendous answers. You made reference to the change in the GED test that will become a computer-based test. We think perhaps, although that would be very challenging corrections, it might be a driver of some change in that area. So we do have some reason for optimism, but it's a very, very challenging area. And both topics, I'd be very glad to follow up with you in, in terms of additional discussion. I, th I think we're going to um, end a couple minutes early so that you can come up and talk to the panelists because there's some echoing here and we're not really getting good fix on the question. So let's do a final thank you to the panel and appreciate. <laughs>